we're talking about the Houston Rockets, a team with too many prospects, with too many players, with opportunities to do something good, but it is very confusing. But Michael Bolton, he knows exactly what's going to happen. He just won't tell me. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy, your daily NBA fantasy podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I'd like to announce a new collector's edition watch, $100,000. You just have to send me the money. It's a collector's item. It's going to be awesome, fantastic, one of the best watches ever. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at locked on fantasy basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Fangio. You can start the season with a big return on Fangio. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit fangio.com right now to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. Yeah, double bang, thumb it up and leave your comments. Rockets season preview show We're on the weekend here for me. It's Saturday morning. I am not sure that we get, uh, that I'm going to do two shows across the weekend. It's the last weekend. Well, that's actually AFL Grand Final Day today. It's the last weekend before my son's baseball season starts uh, next weekend. Uh, so I don't know what we're going to do. We'll see how we go with uh, getting the two shows out. But you know, there's going to be plenty of shows. We're going to get all 30 of these teams done. We're going to have some analysts on at the end of next week as well. We're going to do updated sleeper and bus shows. I am just waiting to see if there's going to be a change in the Yahoo board in the next few days because ESPN's made changes. But I don't want to put out just an ESPN only one. I want to do a combined one. So we'll see when that actually happens. Late round flyers, more mock drafts, um, must drafts, do not drafts per round. All that stuff is coming in the next couple of weeks. We're here to talk about the Rockets. Before I do that, though, two injury updates dropped today. One of them is very important. That is Devin Vassell of San Antonio. Apparently he had foot surgery during the offseason. It would have been great to have known that months ago. His reevaluation date is November the 1st. So that's like, yeah, that's not great. I hate a surgery on a lower body part heading into a season. So this does not mean that Vassell returns on November the 1st. It means he's reevaluated then and maybe he returns. But it could also mean that he returns on November the 15th. It could mean he returns December the 1st. It could mean that when he comes back, he sits on back-to-backs. In fact, that's definitely going to happen. It could also mean that he's on limited minutes for a period of time, and I just don't know how long that that is going to be. So there is an outside shot that we don't get full-scale Vassal until Christmas. That's your probably worst case, I would say. I cannot draft him in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Probably hundreds would be where I'd do it. And I think most times he'll just go off the board before I'm interested in that. Who'll start for him? I'll guess it's Steph Castle. It could be Malaka Branham in there, but he's obviously terrible. Um, If Castle does start, sure, you can take a last round flyer. But we know the rule rookie guards usually suck. Castle's already a bad shooter. Uh, He won't be running as the point guard because Chris Paul will be. He didn't put up big defensive stats in college either. The only thing that will be changing here for Castle is an opportunity for more minutes to begin the season, and that doesn't mean that he maintains 30 minutes a night for the rest of the year. So by all means, you can take that flyer, treat it as an early waiver wire thing, but I, I do think there'll be some really early struggles there. But what it does do is it, it does mean extra usage because Vassell was going to be number two. So Keldon Johnson is going to step back, step back into more usage. Harrison Barnes probably does a little bit more usage-wise as well now, as unappealing as that is. Chris Paul probably has to take a shot or two more. And Branham's going to have to do more also. Maybe it's Julian Champagne who also starts there too. So nothing super interesting. I could look at Calden. I could look at Cassell. Cassell? Castle. Um, to replace Devin uh, Vassell. Now, again, Castle's more of the one-for-one positional replacement, whereas Calden's more of a 3-4 versus a 2. So that's, that's that one. The other one is Vince Williams having a stress reaction in his leg. Never a great sign. That's a four-week injury that they've set at the moment. And Memphis is dreadful at giving accurate timelines. At least they told us about this one. Vince, who did the Grizzlies show the other day, I said, look, 28 minutes a night is going to be pretty useful. Absolutely just not drafting him now. Ooh, that's why I lose my voice. Four weeks is cool. That That is the beginning of the season that he will miss. And then that's potentially an ongoing thing. He's already in a limited bench role. What this does mean, though, is for deeper leagues, it's going to have to be Jake LaRavia because there's no GG Jackson. There is no Vince Williams now to begin the season. So it's 
going to have to be LaRavia, I'm guessing, for deeper leagues that plays those minutes um, in that second unit. And it doesn't really change much for any of the starters because I don't think Vince was going to start, but it does, I guess, solidify Zach Eady in that starting position. So they were just a couple of injury things that, that popped up over the last few hours. And that's where we're at. Also, you don't have to draft Terrence Mann now. He signed a contract extension. Therefore, this is not a contract year. Therefore, he will definitely not be better. So um, that's done, unfortunately. I don't make the rules. I don't make the rules. I just look into the narratives, prove them wrong, and still don't get believed. That's okay. Um, let's talk Houston Rockets. Let's talk about the season coming up for this team. And despite the um, discussion that I had just then about saying how they've got a lot of good young prospects... I actually don't think there's really any confusion over their starting group. Fred Van Vliet, Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, Jabari Smith, and the delicate dancer, Alperen Shangun. You could easily argue Dylan Brooks is trash. Bad on offense, overrated on defense. They've got way too many other prospects who will play over him. You could easily argue that. And I, I, I might have agreements there. That doesn't mean that he's going to get benched because they've got options. They could put Tyree Eason there. They could put Ken Whitmore there. They could put a Men Thompson there. There's a lot of things they could do. Doesn't mean they will. You could also argue they'll start Tari Eason over Jabari Smith. You could argue it. I think you've got about 1% chance of being right on that. You could also make an insane argument that Reed Shepard or Ramen Thompson start over Jalen Green. Don't think it'll happen. I think there's a possibility that something changes throughout the season. But I'm pretty sure that Van Vliet, Green, Brooks, Smith, Shangun is going to be the opening night starting group outside of something wild happening or some sort of injury news breaking that at this point we obviously uh, obviously don't know about. Let's talk about some undervalued guys, and, and this team does have a few of those, and they've got a few on the other side of it as well, in terms of where some value sits that I don't 100% agree with. And on the undervalued side, we have got um, Fred Van Vliet. I, I just don't understand this for Van Vliet. His ADP on Yahoo is 39. His rank is 38. ESPN's ADP. Now, ESPN's ADPs, we must remember this, is they are using a rolling ADP system. They do not use data from periods ago. It sort of just shortens to, I don't know what the time frame is. Maybe it's a week. So two weeks ago, he was at 96 or whatever. And now he's at 62. And he'll probably keep coming in and coming in and coming in. And their, their numbers will change five, six ADP slots every day, which is, again, indicative that they're either using a weighted ADP or a rolling ADP. But ADP 62 is very clearly insane. A fan track's ADP of 33 is too late. And even on ESPN points leagues where Van Vliet is not as valuable, he's ranked 49th with an ADP of 62. I've got no problem with Fred Van Vliet in round two of fantasy drafts. I don't really see what's going to change for Freddles this season. He's going to play a lot of minutes still. He gets steals at a high rate. His shots, are, she's block, shot blocking is pretty good. His assist numbers are very high and he's elite from the free throw line. Yes, he will not score huge amounts. He only had 20 uses last season. And yes, he's a bad field goal player. That is all true. And you have to understand how to deal with that in, in a head-to-head -head situation. If you said that I'll take him in round three at this early part, I get that. But in the 60s, is crazy. After round three is crazy for Van Vliet. There's, he is a short guard and he is 31. So maybe he just loses everything. And maybe he just ends up being bad. But he was good last season. Better than you think he was. And I, I don't... I know they drafted Reed Shepard. But I really don't think that a team that is pushing for the playoffs will say, all right, rookie point guard, undersized as well. We'll just put him in over the guy that we're paying you know, $40 million or $35 million a year to. Now, Van Vliet might get traded. I really don't think he will. And if they have a really bad season, maybe they move off of him. And maybe he's not even on this team next season. That is possible. But I really don't think we should be avoiding Van Vliet and pushing him down draft boards the way he currently is. The other guy that, again, has... And I'm surprised that I'm putting Tari Eason on an undervalued player list because he usually gets fluffed a lot. Man, Eason's so good. He needs to play all these minutes. And, and okay, he does impact winning a lot. He's a re very strong rebounder, a really good defensive guy, a really good defensive stats player who's got iffy shooting. He played 22 minutes a night, 20% usage last season. He's 6'8". He's probably more suited to play the four than playing the three. And one of the things I wanted to highlight with Eason is I think where he goes in drafts in later rounds is fine, but ESPN categories and points for some reason has him both ranked in exactly the same spot, 212th. And that, that's ridiculous. That again suggests to you that in 16-team leagues, you just ignore Tari Eason, which is clearly folly. You don't do that. You should be drafting him in 14-team leagues. You can make an argument to draft him in 12s. The upside argument on him is tough to get to because it would require either him playing out of position at the three 
or taking over from Jabari Smith, and I'm not sure either of those things happen. But we know what he does. He's 10 and 7 last season in 22 minutes with 1.4 steals and 0.9 blocks. And the free throws are bad, but the, f- the three pointers move up and down. He missed a lot of time last season with that tumor they discovered on his leg. Remember, he played 82 games as a rookie, and games played do not carry over. Remember that. But he's always that guy that we're going to have in- intrigue in. I do think there are times that, um, that Tari gets overrated, and the expectations of him are higher than maybe realism would suggest. But, I, I, yeah, that 212th ranking spot is is clearly crazy. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. NFL fans can start off this season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. When you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you're watching, you're sitting there, you can go into the FanDuel app and right on the same spot where you would place those bets, you can check out the stats, you can check out the latest live play-by-play and so much more on that exact same page where all of the bets show up. And as a new customer, if you go in and place a $5 bet, you get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. You don't have to win. You just get guaranteed $200 bonus bets. So go to fanjewel.com and don't forget to gamble responsibly. Okay, so if we talked undervalued, who are overvalued players? Are there guys that are ranked a little bit high? And yep, my word, there are. We're going to start with actually all the overrated guys seem to be, well, not seem to be, literally are, uh, on ESPN. And we'll start with one of the most obvious ones across the entirety of the NBA, and that is Jalen Green, who had an 11-game stretch where he was very good. An 11-game stretch where he was very good. The rest, probably not as good. To be kind, it it wasn't as good. Green um, just, just was not that player. But ESPN's gone, all right, We go hard. He's ranked 50th for category leagues for them. He's ranked 38th for points leagues. He has an ADP at 43. That is assuming a ton for Jalen. I think that it is way more likely that Jalen Green is traded or benched than it is that he hits those numbers. Green is a 6'4 shooting guard. He played 32 minutes with 27 usage. And before the injury to Shingun last season and before his hot streak, Green was routinely getting benched in fourth quarters. He'd played 29 minutes a night at times. He averaged 19 points. And to be fair, five rebounds and three and a half assists out of a shooting guard is okay. But that's like a worse Zach Levine. And yeah, he is hitting into year four. But outside of an 11-game run last season, there's nothing to suggest to me that he's ready to blow up. Because after that run, and we're going to put him under the lens later on, he went back to sort of being bad Jalen. The free throws are solid, but they're not absolutely elite, elite. The field goals are bad. He doesn't generate defensive stats. I think that is an absolutely gigantic mistake if you were drafting on ESPN to consider him at that 40 zone, even in points leagues to go into the into the, the, into the the 30s. It, it makes no sense. The other one that I think is being ranked in a pretty crazy spot that I, I can't make sense of is the guy they picked at number three. And you could make an argument that Reed Shepard might end up being the best rookie in this week draft class. That's true. He very well could be. Um, but ranking him at 95 for category leagues inside the top 100, who I believe is their top rank rookie, when he has to play behind Green, who they obviously think is going to be awesome. He has to play behind Fred Van Vliet, who they guess they don't think is going to be awesome based on the rankings. And they also have a Men Thompson, who is by far a better prospect. And I just don't get it. I, 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 I don't get this. What, what are we doing? And in points leagues, he's got a rank of 111. Sure, you want to take Reed Shepard at 130? Go for it. He came off the bench in college for Kentucky. He's six foot one. He played 29 minutes, but he only had 18% usage in college. 12 points with four and a half assists. Look, two and a half steals is excellent. 0.7 blocks is excellent. 54% shooting is actually out of this world, and he shot 50% from three. I think he's going to be a really good shooter, but he's not going to be that. And he wasn't an elite free throw guy. That is putting way too much faith on someone who doesn't come in with a starting role, who doesn't come in with a robust college profile, even though the, the stats and the per minute stuff is very interesting. And the defensive stuff, I believe, is real. I think he's going to be a good player. But him for this season at that spot is... Is lunacy. I think I, I I don't I cannot rationalize it at all. I cannot get behind taking him in that spot, which I believe is one spot on ESPN, uh, one spot ahead of Demar Derozan, and about fifty spots ahead of drafting DeAndre Ayton, and about ten spots ahead of Jimmy Butler. Oh, sorry, just ten spots behind Jimmy Butler. So again, 
factor that part in when you're considering whether you want to draft Reed Shepard at 95? The answer to the question, should I draft Reed Shepard at 95, is a very big resounding no. Um, let's talk about breakout candidates. And normally I have one or two breakout candidates on teams, but honestly, with this team, there's a lot. This does not mean that all of these guys are going to break out. But there's potential. They've got great value or upside and opportunity maybe is there. Like Jalen Green, I just talked about. I don't believe in Jalen Green in that third round spot or fourth round spot. He's had plenty of opportunities, but maybe. Maybe it clicks. Maybe he becomes efficient. Maybe they decide, yes, despite our success with Van Vliet and Shangun doing a lot of stuff, we move away from that and we give Jalen all the shots. Maybe. Seems incredibly unlikely to me, but maybe. Maybe Tari Eason is the breakout player. Maybe they decide that they don't want Jabari Smith being, a, yeah, after it being a top three pick, that they decide that Eason is the guy that they want putting up those numbers and being the starting power forward. Maybe they want to replace Dylan Brooks with Tari Eason. Maybe. Unlikely, but possible. And then there is the other side of it. What if it's Jabari Smith in year three that breaks out? I think that's probably more likely, but you know, where does he get the extra shots? Nobody left usage-wise. He had 18 usage in 32 minutes, and his, his minutes went up last season. His percentages went up. He averaged 14 and 8. I thought that he'd be a guy that would generate pretty decent defensive numbers from the rip coming out of college, and he did not. And that burnt me when he, he was a rookie. because so I was looking at him in the 80s, going, hey, steals, blocks, a couple of threes. Maybe he's a 13 and 7 sort of a player, but that didn't happen. Steven Silas was crazy in terms of never running a single play for him, but that happened. So last season, he averaged 14 and 8. With 0.7 steals and 0.8 blocks, the field goal percentage improved, but it's still pretty bad. But he could become a 49% shooter. Maybe he's a 17-point guy with nine rebounds and he plays 34 minutes, and they do prioritize him usage-wise. I don't think he does. They do, but he could. Another guy on this breakout list is Amen Thompson. And I love Amen. I think Amen was a very clear third-best prospect in last year's draft. I would still... Yeah, I might even cons- honestly, if I was going to consider anyone over Scoot, who I had it to, it wouldn't be Brandon Miller. It'd be a Men Thompson. And when a Men he suffered an early injury last season, and then when he came back, he showed it. He played every position basically. He played center, honestly, at times. He played point guard. He plays on the wing. But like when talking about Reed Shepard or talking about Tari Eason, I don't know where the minutes come from. He's going to get twenty ish, and if he gets twenty five, he's a very easy twelve team league player. Last season, he played 22 minutes. He had 10, 6.5, and, and 2.5. And he got 1.3 steals and 0.6 blocks and shot 54%, despite being about a 12% three-point shooter, and that is only a marginal exaggeration, and he's bad at free throws. But what if they say, oh my God, you are literally unstoppable here. Jalen, you are benched. Dylan, you are benched. Amen plays 29. We are rocking and rolling. I-, I think that he is going to be a clear top 40-ish fantasy player by year three or four. Not sure it comes here, but out of everyone on this list, Jalen Green, Tari Eason, Jabari Smith, a man, and the last one is Cam Whitmore. Uh, I have a man by far the best option out of these group uh, group of guys and the guy that's more likely to me to sort of just kick it into high gear and, and, and really take a role. Cam Whitmore's a player that in the draft slid. We know this. He came out as a rookie with insane usage, honestly, for a rookie, 27% usage um, in 19 minutes a night. He's a 6'7 wing. He's got negative vision, if that's even possible. He generated big steal numbers through his um, college time. That didn't really come across all that much, but he scored pretty well. His percentages are iffy. I think they're going to improve a bit. His three-point numbers are good, but what he does is a volume three-point guy, a volume scorer, who maybe can generate some defensive numbers. But again, like there is Tari Eason, there is Dylan Brooks. He's not really a two, so he's not really a Jalen Green thing, but we know that like usage, especially for points leagues, if you get minutes, usage is unbelievable. And that is exactly what Whitmore brings. So these are all guys that under certain circumstances, you can see breakouts. Eason could replace Smith or Brooks. Green could actually just be better. Jabari could assert himself more. Amen Thompson could take over from a number of different players and just be so dynamic that they cannot play him fewer minutes. And Whitmore's scoring just takes on a different look and a different level that, again, that it forces the hand. And when you've got a guy like Dylan Brooks in the starting lineup where, look, there is value there, but it can easily disappear. And Jalen Green, who got benched numerous times last season. And Jabari, who's been fine, but without like blowing the doors off. I don't even have to blow the bloody doors off. Shout out Michael Kane. Terrible Michael Kane accent. I haven't actually worked on it. But there's a lot of different ways that this can go in, in directions that help 
help a lot of these players. Let's take a look at where some risks may lie in the rotation. And there's quite a few again because there is just so many prospects. And on the top of this list of rotation risks, I just simply put the name Stephen Adams because Stephen Adams is on this team. Stephen Adams was traded to this team last season, didn't play at all. And Stephen Adams is purely a backup center. And last season, I was very, very clear. Maybe I wasn't, but I was very clear, I thought, on my take on Alperen Sengun. I really like Alperen Sengun. I think he's an unbelievably good player. And I think his defensive shortcomings were incredibly blown out of proportion. But I also said that I was a little worried about how the front office and Ime Yudoka would view him. Would he become a scapegoat? Because they went, they were at pains in the last offseason to bring in another center, i.e. Brook Lopez, to limit Sengun. And they that Brook Lopez pulled out last second, giggity, and Sengun was into a large role and he dominated. But now they've got Steven Adams. So what if Ime Yudoka, noted um, defensive lover, I'm not saying he's a defensive lover, he might be an, uh, an aggressive lover. Who knows? Some people might. But Adams, is he going to play like 15 minutes a night backing up Sengun? Will they use this as an excuse to say, well, Sengun, you're not defending very well? Still no contract extension for Sengun, by the way. And Adams plays 23 minutes a night and Sengun plays 25 because I don't think they can play together. I, I, with what Shingun showed last season, it was very obvious that he was awesome and he was the best player on this team. But there are still a couple little nagging thoughts in my head of like, what do they, what do they do this with Adams? Adams, the last time we saw him, we're not drafting him, obviously, but he played 27 minutes a night for Memphis. He averaged nine and almost 12 rebounds with a block on 60% shooting and an unfathomable 36% from the line. He's not playing those 27 minutes, but he was really good. Now, he's missed a whole season. This knee is a real problem for him, clearly. But again, his impact for fantasy is maybe it gives them extra ability to um, bring Shengun into a more annoying position. Like I said earlier, maybe they minimize Dylan Brooks and they play more of men. And even that, like if they even if they do minimize Brooks, it still could be a men. It could be more Reed. It could be Tari. It could be Cam. Okay, so look, maybe not even a clear answer there. They could ship off Jalen Green. That is possible. That is possible. And what if Tyree Eason or let's like, say or even throw a Men Thompson into this mix? They could pressure the player ahead of them. They could pressure Dylan Brooks. They could pressure Jalen Green. They could pressure Jabari Smith. There's so many different guys here that can put pressure on players that while we feel good that the lineup is going to look how it is, but there are just a, there are many different ways in which this can all go that could throw it all out of control. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Price Picks is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports as well. All you have to do is pick more or less on two to six individual player projections and you watch the winnings roll in. And now with one more weekend left in September, we've got, they've got a great offer um, on the Caleb Williams projection. If Caleb Williams gets one passing yard, that automatically gets you one win on prize picks, on prize picks in September. That is basically a free W all the way through um, in this you know, for week four here in the NFL. You can also find ways to check out celebrities' picks on prize picks. You check it out on the promos tab under community plays. You've got Joe Budden. You've got Sugar Sean O'Malley. You've got Drewski in there as well. So many celebrities putting their numbers out there, which you can uh, track and see how they go and tail or fade or do whatever you want on it. So download the Price Picks app today and use the code Locked On NBA to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. The code is Locked On NBA on Price Picks to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive that fifty dollars bonus. It is guaranteed. Price Picks run your game. So let's put Jalen Green under the lens because. Obviously, there are different thoughts on who Jalen is as a uh, as a player. There's obviously a, a pure Hooper narrative around where Jalen sits because there's no other reason for him to be ranked as high as he is on ESPN or for people to fluff how good he is. Because I would say that for the most part, his career has been a sizable disappointment. You can look at this um, these graphs over here for or from Crafted NBA, and you see there's not like many significant bright greens. There's a lot of like beiges. There's some reds in terms of being bad. So his you know, defensive rebound and offensive rebounding is bad. His creation to turnover percentage is very low, meaning you know he's not a big creation guy, but he still screws it up a lot. His shooting quality is mid-pack. 
His free throw rate and three-point attempt rate is mid. His true shooting is incredibly low. His passer rating is below average. Doesn't really protect the rim. We don't expect him to. His defensive versatility is not great. His defensive value overall is terrible. His best offensive similarity is Jordan Clarkson. Okay? That's not necessarily a player we, we look to. Overall, the Mikhail Bridges one is, is interesting as a as a comp. Um, defensively, being Rui Hachimura or Torres Max, he's yeah, a slap in the face. But what I do want to look at here is the, the most common used offensive play type for Jalen is pick and roll ball handler. He only averaged three and a half assists. And the fact that they brought in another point guard and maybe we get Amen Thompson not having an injury plague season and he's in year two. So how much does... Jalen, who ran that play 40% of the time, how much does he get to be the pick-and-roll ball handler? I'm not saying he was super successful at it. With Van Vliet, with Reed, with the men. If that's what Jalen did, what if that gets pulled down? And then it takes away some assist opportunities. And then he has to change sort of what he's doing because obviously that's the way they were using him. What if they don't use him that way? I think that that has to be a level of concern. On the right-hand side, you can see his Darko DPM progression. And we know that he had that gigantic spike. And you can see how big that spike was in the second half of the season. And then it did start to drop back off as he sort of headed towards being a neutral player. But for the first time in his career, Jalen Green became a positive player, which again is room for um, excitement. It is room for optimism. I don't share as much of that optimism, but it was an unbelievable run. I would have loved if it had it kept going through the end of the season versus falling away. And the fact that it needed their best player to be out and... It happened against a bunch of teams who, honestly, outside of like one of them, will, were not trying at all. It gives me a distinct lack of optimism. On the left-hand side, the headshot plot, we've got the X-axis saying potential assists per 100 passes. So, you know, potential assists are when you're setting up guys and it would be assist if the shot went in, but it doesn't, right? Which is sort of out of your control because you've set them up for it. The Y-axis is pick and roll ball handling points per shot. So we talked about green being, that being the most um, used play type. So how efficient... Was he on it? Well, in the bottom left-hand corner, at 65th percentile on potential assists and under 75th percentile in pick-and-roll ball handler points per shot, it's Jalen Green. And the guys that I compared him against are guys that I think people would say are relatively similar. There's a Desmond Bain there, like as a shooting guard who handles the ball. There's Bogdan Bogdanovich as a shooting guard who handles the ball. The other one is teammate Fred Van Vliet, who's playing next to him. Now, Van Vliet's potential assists per 100 passing per 100 passes is like 95th or 90, about 95th percentile. Jalen's is 65th. They're passing to the same teammates. So that just means Fred, to me, is just doing way more to set up his teammates. Desmond Bain, for potential assist, 85th percentile. Bogdan Bogdanovic, around 77th. Jalen Green, 65th. So those guys who are similar are missing out on more assists than Jalen is. And then we know that Jalen was doing a lot of pick and roll ball handling. His efficiency, down is the lowest out of this group. Fred, 80th percentile. Bain, 75th. Jalen's about 73rd, and Bogdan's at about 90th. So he ran a lot of pick and roll. He's not that efficient at it. He didn't miss out on a ton of assists through his elite passing. So again, I don't know why they would continue to run a lot of pick and roll for him when there are other options out there. The similar player radar chart for fantasy for Jalen, number one is Desmond Bain, which I, I get it, but Bain is a lot more efficient. Then it's Zach Levine, who was a name I referenced earlier, Brandon Miller, and Bogdan Bogdanovich. And we know that Bogdanovich and he goes later in drafts, and Levine's in that 70 zone, and Miller's probably in the 50s or 60s, which I get it. But Jalen needs a lot more to be sort of considered with those guys. And you can see his thick blue line is the inner line out of this group, meaning he's got a similar shape to these players, but he's just way worse. And yeah, I, I, I'm just not going to share that level of optimism that exists around Jalen based on some of those rankings. Let's take a look at some players where we have to have some concern with injuries, just give some updates on that. And we will start here with the best player on the Houston Rockets, a guy whose season was over due to an injury which looked pretty significant, to be honest. And that was uh, the delicate dancer, Alperen Sengun. There was a worry of a significant, like, um, uh, ACL issue. But in the end, it turned out to be, it turned out to be a... Um, Uh, grade three ankle sprain, which is significant enough, but he is good and ready to go. I already gave you my potential concerns on Shingun and how they might use Adams, but like he's 22. He had 32 minutes and 27 usage, averaging 21, nine and five with 1.2 steals. He shot 54 from the field. 
yes, he only shot 69 from the line, and that seemed to get worse. I think that you know, 74, 75 is maybe best case for where Shengun's free throws can go. I'm not sure he's ever going to be a prolific shot blocker. I'm not sure he's ever going to be a prolific three-point shooter. So I think there is a cap overall on what Shengun does, but he is also just 22. So, you know, things can improve. Maybe he does just become a better shooter. And we've already seen big steps forward for Shengun in many different spots. At the moment, like, he's getting drafted in some interesting areas, 30th on Yahoo, 27th on Fantrax. I actually think if you wanted to get him in round two and early mid-round two in points leagues, it's okay. But you have to understand the ups and downs or the the, the the limitations in certain categories that do exist for Alperen. I don't think that it's absolutely just while well, we've got way, way more runway here to to go crazy. Like, could he? Like, he averaged twenty one. Could he be a twenty five point guy? Maybe. But remember, the guys he can, is, gets compared to a lot, like a Demonte Sabonis. Like Sabonis isn't necessarily a twenty point per game scorer, but Sabonis is an eight assist guy. But this guy is a dominating post player. He's a, he's a dominating scorer in that area. And, and I'm not going to put it past him to be able to add even more to his game. So I really like Alperen Sengun. I think he can be a top 20 player, but I'm still going to have some concerns regarding the way the Rockets handle him. The other injuries there are Tari Eason, who missed last season with that stress reaction that turned into a bone tumor. He is good and good to go, and I haven't heard any issues with that at the moment. So that's a positive. And then Steve Adams missed with the knee. He's going to miss time this season as well. So I guess that's another tick in the Shengun box is that Adams' health is not something that the Rockets or anyone can rely on. If we take a look at Houston and their overall playoff schedule, it's, um, it's not an ideal one or just their overall fantasy schedule. 48 quality games is on the low side, meaning when you're looking at those later round players, whether you're taking a flyer on an Eason or a Reed Shepard or a Jalen Green or an Amen Thompson, is that they have fewer quality games than other teams, meaning you're going to be forced into more start-sit start, start, sit decisions. They've got 16 back-to-backs, which is the maximum. Now, that doesn't really worry us with much of this apart from Adams, but of course, when a player gets hurt and when they come back, that improves or increases the games that they miss. They've got only 12 maximum game weeks, so their schedule gets sort of flattened. They don't have a lot of spike weeks, so to speak, if that's what you want to call them. Their playoff schedule is pretty good. If you end on March 23rd, my recommended date, it's a 4-4-4, the best there is. The best there ever was, and the best there ever will be. For If you finish for finishing on March the 30th, you've got a 4-4-3 schedule. If you go Yahoo default, it's 4-3-4, and ESPN default is 4-3-4-3. So the actual games played in the playoffs schedule-wise is okay. It, it's, it's fine. Let's take a look at the youth invasion, and this is the biggest list I think I've had for any team, and this is a team that, that I do believe Houston is going to be on the door of the play-in and maybe even making the playoffs. So I've got six guys on this team who are currently under the age of 23, and we've talked about I think all of them already, apart from um, the rookie Reed Shepard, and we'll get into him. I oh, know I did talk about Reed Shepard, didn't I? Yeah, no, I have. We've talked about all of these guys. So Shengun, I think for Dynasty, my Bazemore metric has him very high. Like I, I said, top fifteen there, but it actually had him top ten in a rebuild rebuild situation, uh, which is maybe aggressive, but it loves him. It's got Jabari as top seventy five. It's got a men as top fifty. It's got Jalen Green as top fifty, which I'm not a hundred percent on board with that. But the high usage, the still young player. The improvements in assist rate, the value of him getting so much playing time so far does push him up, which is interesting. Reed Shepard comes in at top 125. It is hard with rookies to totally get that, but an undersized rookie in a bad class um, who didn't have high usage in college does downgrade a little bit. And then Cam Whitmore is top 75. But that is six legitimate. Uh, We could throw Reed as a top 100 dynasty prospect if we wanted to, but yeah, let's say five top 100 dynasty players, maybe six, including Reed Shepard, who are all under the age of 23, which is a pretty crazy list. Now, maybe it's Cam Whitmore that I haven't actually talked about. No, I put Cam Whitmore's name up already. So we've done a lot of these. We've talked a lot about these players um, already. Let's squeeze out the risk reward situation, the best case, worst case, based on a lot of variability stuff. Um, I was a little surprised to see that a men Thompson graded out as the most risky and reward guy, and that is not even including minutes variation. I guess some of it is the ups and downs of his shooting numbers, the ups and downs of steal numbers as a general for players. And I still think he's always going to be a good steals guy, but there's big variance there. And his category variance was 86 spots, and his points leagues was 5.3. Still don't mind him as a late-round guy, but there are obvious um, issues that we've got to overcome in terms of where do the minutes go and what happens with his shooting. Like That's, that's the thing. The last thing that we take a look at is the decline phase. Who could be over the hill? We know that 
well, maybe you don't know, maybe you're just tuning in for the first time, but once you hit the age of 29, things can start to drop off. And there are three guys on this team. Two of them we've talked about already. Fred Van Vliet and Steve Adams. We know that Adams is banged up. We know Van Vliet is older. And I think after this season, I'm probably not going to be as high on Van Vliet for fantasy because he goes into a weird free agency situation. The guys that have been sort of brewing and cooking behind him in Houston maybe move into larger roles. I think this might be the last season that I'm actually sort of more in on Van Vliet. And the other one there is Jeff Green, who somehow is still on this team. He's 38 years of age, and that's where we're at. But like, we have to have a level of worry always once you hit over 29 and once you're into your 30s that there's going to be something that drops off. We never know really the level to which it drops off, but there's always a possibility that it drops off. And you've got to sort of at least factor that part in. One of the guys that we haven't really dug into much here is Dylan Brooks, and that's because he's not really a fantasy guy. He's not really someone we need to pay attention to. Brooks is like ADP of 142 and ranked at 196, and like he's just not a guy we need to care about, even though he played 31 minutes a night. And one thing, again, I was critical of Dylan Brooks in Memphis. I was critical of the signing. I was worried about what Brooks was going to do. I thought he might be a little me first in terms of usage, but he pulled it all the way back. He just went, all right, I'm just not going to take these shots anymore, which was really a sign of maturity. Brooks averaged 13 points with two threes, 0.9 steals, 43 and 84. But like for a guy that really started to focus on defense, I would have liked to have seen more defense from him. He doesn't rebound, doesn't get assists. He's just a bad overall fantasy player. The 31 minutes, I don't think he plays 31 this season. I think that actually comes down, but I'm not sure it comes down enough to open up everything for those other guys. But he's got to be feeling really nervous about other guys coming up behind him and being able to um, yeah, maybe take that role. Another guy that is on this team that in the past you know, had a starting job and people actually got excited about him. I was never in on Jay Sean Tate and I don't think he's a rotation guy really. Even though Ima Udoka loves him, he can't really shoot. He's quite undersized. He plays the four. He averaged four and three in 16 minutes last season. Again, we've got Jabara. We've got Tari. We've got Whitmore. We don't need him to play. Maybe he still does. I, I don't know, but I don't think we're going to get him out there. They've got some other guys on their roster. Of course they do. Uh, Aaron Holiday's there, Jacques Landale, who was okay last season, but with Adams and Shangun there and even Jabari playing the five, there's not a lot for Landale to do. They're two-way guys, Jack McVeigh, the Australian, uh, who's a shooter, but he's 28 and he's just not going to play. And Farley Dante, who, interesting numbers coming out of college, but I'm not sure he's going to do anything. And then there's Nate Williams Jr., there's Jermaine Samuels uh, and Nate Hinton, who are sort of the back end of the r- roster and rotation as well, who I don't think we care about too much. So, in terms of drafting guys, I think if you get Fred Van Vliet in round three, awesome. And no problem taking him in round two. Shangun, round three or round two as well, totally reasonable stuff. Jabari Smith, I like him probably in, and I, I, I just tweeted about this saying I shouldn't say rounds. Let's say Van Vliet in the top 25. If you can get him top, if he stretches out to the 30s, great. Shangun, similar. I'd be okay to go top 20. In the 30s, is fine as well. Uh, anywhere in that range is cool. Jabari Smith, There'll be people who go into the 70s for him. I'm not really about that part of it. And like his ESPN ADP is 113, which I do like, but I'm not like predicting a big jump forward for Jabari this season. I've got a men in around that 100 to 130 zone. I'd probably push more towards the 120. If you want to take Jalen Green around 100 just to get some scoring, and I do get that. Not those insane top 40 type numbers, but around 100, I get it, even though there are downsides. Eason's a late round flyer. You could take a flyer on Shepard. I would say the amount of things that need to happen for Shepard to get into enough value, uh, are just it's too much to overcome. And I think you're going to have to, you, you drop him almost after game one. And you need to be in more of a stashable situation with larger benches, roto, games caps, uh, weekly formats to be able to hold him to wait to see if something happens. Because I just don't think we are getting 27 minutes off rip here for Reed to put up those numbers. And yeah, drafting Adams or Whitmore doesn't seem like it's going to be a great situation. But what is a great situation is that we just talked about the Houston Rockets and you can hit a thumb up here on this YouTube video. You can leave your comments down below. And guys, I can tell you that we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.